Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you may be. Welcome to Meat and Poultry HACCP. I'm Dr. Michelle Fannin-Steele, and it is the top of the hour, and we are going to get started. I am so glad that everybody is here to join us. Everything, um, everybody's going to be on mute. Uh, if you have questions, then what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to be popping back and forth from the video to the, um, back and forth from the video to the, uh, to the chat box, because I can't see them both at the same time, and I will be picking up your questions then. I'm so delighted all of you have decided to uh, uh, join us, and this is going to be, uh, this is going to be pretty great. I think I should be able to start my video here. Hang on. All right, there we go. Start video. There we go. All right, so this is me up here um, in the corner. Pin my video. All right, good. So we're just going to get started because we have a lot to get through. This is meat and poultry HACCP, and this is for USDA processing. And I te teach HACCP different from other folks, but that's Okay, because <laughs> um, you guys are not other folks. This is not a HACCP class where you are going to um, learn how to slaughter like 200 chickens a minute. So if that's what you're here for, and I'm pretty sure that you're not, um, you're not, um, you're not in the right spot. But I think we should be okay. Uh, this is a HACCP class where I'm gonna make you work hard, okay? We are all about working hard here at Dirigo Food Safety and not staying in confusion, not being um, in a space of I don't know. So I'm here to answer questions and you have access to us through training at Safety. Dot com and you're going to see that email a lot over the course. And um, if your brain is thinking you're freaking out, you're doing it exactly right. <laughs> okay, so you're doing it exactly right. But I want to tell you, HACCP is doable. I've been doing this training for a very, very long time, and you can. I promise you can do this. Alrighty. So the um, first thing we're going to do, let's start with a squidge background, because the question is, who inspects or regulates what? All right. So we have third, uh, third party inspection systems, national systems, and local systems. Okay. So your local systems are those of you who are getting inspected in your restaurants, uh, under the food code. And there are some of you who are here because you have to write a HACCP plan uh, to conform with your food code, all right? I want you to know that those are HACCP plans in like name only, and you need to understand everything that I'm gonna teach you, but when it comes to setting critical control points and things like that, very often the state does that for you. Okay, and so it's in, um, it's in, um, right, so the, it's written into the, the food code. If you have um, State Department of Agriculture inspection uh, and you do retail exemption under State Department of Agriculture exemption, uh, oftentimes you would need a HACCP if you're curing something, but that's very state and locality dependent. And in some states, it's county dependent. So in Pennsylvania, for existence, for, for instance, uh, they have different laws about um, writing a HACCP plan if you're curing like whole muscle cures or salami or whatever um, in different counties. And it's, I'm not gonna lie, fairly confusing. <laughs> so, so those are your local systems. Okay. And then the national systems, which is what most of you guys are under, is the USDA Meat and Poultry Products Inspection Acts. Just to note, these are two different acts. All right. We have another national system of food inspection, which is the Food Safety Modernization Act. Now, some of you are here because you are writing voluntary HACCP plans. And that's under third party inspection. This is a codex HACCP course. You are required to write a HACCP plan for an SQF process. 
under uh, the Codex Elementarius HACCP system. And this course is designed to meet those requirements. And if you are going after a global food safety initiative uh, audit like SQF or BRC, this class meets those requirements. Uh, and you're going to need to do all of the things, all 12 steps that I'm going to be talking about in great depth over the coming um, calls for you to uh, be able to comply with those systems. So it's important for you guys to understand where you are in local, national, or third party systems. Okay. So the question is, is who inspected it? Well, this is ground beef. This can be inspected at the local level by your health inspector. It can be inspected at the local level by your USDA inspector, okay? This is under the retail grind rule, all right? And it can be inspected at the national level or the state level by a USDA or a state inspector. Mm -hmm. This is chicken. If you make fewer than a thousand chickens, a year. This is not inspected by anybody <laughs> and you can sell it off your farm. Uh, if you make between a thousand and uh, 19,999. This is going to be inspected by your state and you may or may not need a HACCP plan, but you will need good manufacturing practices, which we'll talk about when we talk about programs. Uh, and this may also be inspected by the USDA if you make more than 20,000 chickens a year. So the inspection schemes can be super confusing. Mm. So the first question we ask, and I ask all of my clients, is what do you make? And then we ask, how do you make it? And then we ask, where do you get your supplies from? By the time you get through this class, you will be able to answer in excruciating detail all of those questions. So congratulations, you're in the right spot. So let's start with what do you make? And we have to talk about your target market because your target market is not necessarily who you think that it is. Okay, so the first thing I like to do with my clients is ask them who their perfect clients are because folks, your business is better when your business is fun. So think about who the customers you really, really like working with are, okay? and solve their problems. And this is how I do it in my, um, in my company, okay? And this, I promise, has to do with HACCP because when you agree that you're gonna make product for your clients, you have to agree to what they want. And this is where we start with that, all right? Mm. Know how you and your team do your best work. This work is boring it's challenging, and it can be hard to show up to. But if you understand all of the reasons that you're doing this as you go into it, you're gonna feel a whole lot better about actually doing your HACCP, okay? And the goal of this course is not, here's a hoop, jump through it. The goal of this course is for you guys to actually be able to implement your HACCP plan as part of your food safety system. And in order to do that, you're gonna to have to stand in fear and discomfort and unknown because that's the way it works, all right? So part two, now, what do you really make, okay? So for um, your products, what I have my clients do, and I'm pretty sure this is in your homework, is that we fill out this entire sheet, okay? You have brand names for your products. You have product ingredients, okay? Bold your allergen ingredients because it'll make it easier later. Understand what your product packaging is because I promise you don't solve problems for clients just by handing them a raw steak, right? You have to actually package that. All right, so then who are your suppliers? Know who your suppliers are, all right? And we're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to risk levels and what food safety plan you're gonna need for that, all right? But right now, I need you to start thinking about what products you have. I have clients who have this go on for like pages and that's totally okay. You make what you make, just know what you make, <laughs> all right? So we're gonna take one of those and we're gonna create a specification because it's through specifications that you create the wealth and community that you're dreaming of. And so my question to you is, is do you wanna do that? Because this course is for people who want 
to build the business that they've always dreamed of, to create that wealth and community. All right, so my bold promise, after this um, introductory, you'll be able to write your own specification and you're gonna know how to have conversations with customers, internal customers and external customers. Because your HACCP plan and your HACCP conversations are for internal customers, okay? You have to be able to communicate to your employees, to your management, to your marketing team, to finance, to the people actually cutting the meat why you're doing this, okay? And you have to be able to articulate all the things I'm about to teach you in order to implement your HACCP plan well. Okay, so as you guys have noticed, I'm a Yankee and I talk super fast. We have a limited amount of time on these calls and I have to get through all of these, okay? So pay attention, ask questions when you need to. I'm probably gonna get to them at the end, okay? So remember, your brain wanting to quit means you're doing it exactly right. I know this can be frightening. I have been there. I once didn't know how to write a HACCP plan either. And I had to audit them for the US Army to make sure that the meat didn't kill our soldiers. So I get it. You can do this. Hmm. All right, so are you with me? Let's do it. All right, so for those of you who don't know, I'm Dr. Michelle Fannin-Steele, and I am a life coach and food system subject matter expert for smallholder foodpreneurs. And I am bringing you this course, and it is designed for smallholder food businesses. Those are the only businesses that I work with, okay? Because we are out there making huge changes in the universe. And my goal is to help you guys solve the hard problems so you can go change the world and create the wealth and community that you always wanted by starting your business. So that's what we do around here. All right. And I started doing all of this stuff and, and realized that specifications are absolutely the place to start. And for those of you who are going for SQF or BRC, you have to start here. This is like the first question they ask. <laughs> All right, and so I was working with a charcuterie company and they wanted, um, they wanted to get into distribution, but in order to get into distribution, they needed a third party audit. And in order to pass their third party audit, they actually needed to write their specs, okay? This is like, was one of the specs and supplier approval were like the main things that were um, keeping them out of the marketplace. They wrote their specs and everything else fell in line, which is why I teach this. Mm. All right, so let's create one really great specification. So here are the secrets to a great spec. Um, all right, they make you look legitimate, all right? You have to schedule the time to do this. The biggest problem my clients have is failure to schedule time, all right? And then the next thing is, is your employees, internal, your internal customers, by and large, don't have a big picture of what you make and you have to explain it to them and specifications is how we do that. All right, so secret number one, they're just for the big players. No, they make you look legitimate, all right? They really describe your product, but please, for heaven's sakes, you're probably gonna be sending these out. Do not put proprietary info in these. Do not say you use, you know, like four pounds of back fat to one pound of sausage for a 10 kilo batch. Don't do that, <laughs> okay? General, um, you need to have your, your um, information general enough so that people aren't gonna derive your recipe and your proprietary information, but specific enough so that people know what you're talking about. And so I don't wanna see garlic, I wanna see dried garlic or fresh garlic, mm -hmm. okay? I don't wanna see rosemary, I wanna see dried rosemary or fresh rosemary, it's that sort of thing, okay? Hope this is making sense. I'm gonna pop over and see if anybody has questions. And hang on. Um, no. Okay, um, it's not showing me questions in screen share. That's awesome. Okay, I'm gonna stop the screen share at the end and I'll look for your questions. Um, I'll look for your questions at the end, okay? All right, so in your specification, you need to have a header, all right? This is an ISO header, so my friends who are going after SQF, uh, you need to pay attention here, all right? So the person with the responsibility signs this thing in. That is not necessarily the owner. The bigger you are, the less likely it is to be the owner. It may be the GM, it may be the QA manager, it just depends. 
Document numbering is important as you go towards your SQF audit. I recommend doing document numbering last. And by the way, document numbers don't actually have to be numbers. They can be names. <laughs> and a lot of times that can be a lot less confusing for people because 2.4.1.36 is meaningless to most people. All right. You need to put a revision or an implementation date. So for those of you who have never done this before, you're going to have an implementation date on this. All right. And um, then if it, um, you have, we do one of these spec logs for every, um, uh, for every product you make, okay? Now, that doesn't necessarily translate to every SKU because some of you, some of you have SKUs that are by product size or part number or whatever. Um, lump as much as you can because you're gonna be writing a lot of these if you're going after SQF, um, okay? All right, your product name and ingredients. Uh, some of us have product numbers. Some of us refer to those as part numbers and that may track in your enterprise resource planning system, not necessarily. All right, you need to know what your brand name is. Not, you don't, not everybody sells under their brand name. And if you are co-packing for somebody, put those brand names here. Mm -hmm. Product titles, if different, pretty obvious. All right, product description. This is where we start thinking about our food safety. Is your product a ready to eat product? Is it a not ready to eat product? Is it shelf stable? Is it, um, you know, any of the big product descriptions that you really need to know that to describe your food. If you were describing this food to somebody, what would you say? Don't put your marketing information in here, but you know, like the pertinent things, right? Net weights. If you have multiple sizes, all right, put multiple net weights in here. Okay. Uh, because that's the, um, that's an easier way to do it rather than doing one of these, unless your packaging is different. If your packaging is totally different, if you have a retail pack and a food service pack, you should probably have two different specifications. And you're going to put in all of your ingredients, all right, and you're gonna bold out your allergens. This becomes very, very important. I was looking at the news and there was a gigantic recall of like, I don't know, eight, like 83,000 pounds of something from ConAgra got recalled uh, for allergen labeling problems. So it's a really big deal. Mm -hmm. Allergen declaration. In our specifications, we do allergen declarations. If uh, you have allergens in your ingredient list, you got to put an X in the present box. And for USDA, this is really where we begin to start talking about your allergen control planning, which is one of the programs that you have to have. All right, we'll be talking more about that later. If you manufacture things at the same time, okay, so you have two different lines, and over here you're making salami with dried milk as your binder, and over here you're making salami with soy protein as your binder, you have to de declare milk and soy as maybe present on both of them, all right? I recommend segregating that by time, by the way. <laughs> All right, and then you have to, um, and then if it's absent, you have to declare it absent. You are not helping yourself if you um, are labeling yourself into allergen control by saying allergens may be present. The USDA will not accept those, okay? So those are our allergens. Under shellfish, if you guys are making uh, what we call comminuted sausages with shellfish in them, it meets the predominant ingredient. FSIS is in charge of that, not FDA. And it's important to note that this is crustacean shellfish only. If you have other products that are shellfish and scalefish, this is not the class that you can take to do shellfish and scalefish under FDA. All right, scalefish is all your ground fish and that, and that sort of thing, okay? Also, I wanna point out that this is a United States list. If you sell into Canada or you sell into Europe, look into uh, sesame seed and mustard. And there are a couple others that I can't remember. Hmm. All right, storage and use. How does your customer actually use your food? All right, this is, these questions are gonna become very, very important when it comes into food safety planning. I have a whole other slide set about it, all right? Mm. Who, wh how does your consumer use it? Is it ready to eat? Is it ready to cook? How are they supposed to cook it? Mm. How are they supposed to store it? Does it have to be stored below 40 degrees? Is it shelf stable? Mm. All right, 
how do you know what your shelf life was? Okay, so I get shelf life questions all the time. There are labs out there that will analyze your shelf life. If you are going after an SQF audit, you're gonna need to know this information and you're gonna have to have shelf life testing. Mm -hmm. All right, nutrition claims, all right? All our nutrition claims are the same. If you're not big enough for nutrition claims, don't worry about it, but you need to know whether or not your customer requires nutrition claims. You're not gonna sell to Whole Foods, no matter what size you are, without nutrition information on the back, okay? And when you submit your labels to LSAS, they need to know whether or not you're including nutrition information. And if you are, your inspector can check your nutrition labeling, okay? Especially those protein fat ratios. So be very careful. If you're small enough and you don't need nutritional information, don't put it on there, mm, all right? But I'm pretty sure you guys know an awful lot of this stuff, right? Mm, all right, so let's decrease the overwhelm about it. And I want you to think about this for the whole entire course. That's why I do it first. Um, all right, so the next thing we're gonna do is lab tested traits. We are gonna have so many conversations about this in um, a couple of days about what these things are supposed to be, okay? I know these are confusing to you right now, but you, we're gonna clear up this confusion and it's gonna be okay, all right? And you can always ask me questions. Hmm. All right, so your results have to have an actual result, like colony forming units per gram, or absent, or 1,000 colony forming units per gram, or most probable number, all right? That's your results. Your methodology has to be an a acceptable USDA methodology, and you have to be able to prove it. Your laboratory that you do your testing with will help you on this. That's what they are there for. All of this information is available through your laboratory, okay? So this in your specification is what you wanna see, all right? So for total plate counts for raw products, we are looking for under 10,000 colony forming units per gram in an acceptable USDA or AOAC methodologies, all right? Same thing with yeast and mold. Generic cull forms has to be under 10 colony forming units per gram or absent. E. coli, same thing. Salmonella is absent. Shigatoxin E. coli is absent. And in a raw food, we don't test for listeria, okay? So this is not your definitive list. Your definitive list is dependent upon your food. In a ready-to-eat food, there are many places that will not take it with a total plate count over 1,000 for total plate count or for yeast and mold. Generic coliforms is the same. E. coli is the same, less than 10 colony forming units per gram. Okay, if you use cheese and wanna be uh, as part of your product, your cheese must also meet less than 10 colony forming units per gram. The FDA changed that in the past two years and you guys need to know that. Salmonella must be absent, Shigatox and E. coli must be absent and Listeria must be absent. Okay, so you guys are all asking me, where do you find more info? Well, I just gave you a ton of info, but Google is your friend, okay? And when Google is your friend, you can find out a lot of things, <laughs> all right? And the other thing is, is your customers, if you're selling into big places, your customers have specifications. Maybe you should ask them, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Just ask them. All right, so next, organoleptic traits. So organoleptic is like one of my favorite words, and it means testing using your five senses. And this is really fun. All right, I want you to be able to describe how your food tastes, smells, sounds as best you can, how it feels, all right, and what it's supposed to look like. Get yourself a color chart. There's tons of information out there about how to do organoleptic testing, but the, the trick behind this is how do you know when you're looking and holding your food uh, that you actually made what you said you were gonna make, okay? All right, and I promise when you do this right, we do this once and we review them once a year. That's it, okay? I know that sounds nuts, but that's totally okay. Yeah? So here's the next thing. I know you all know that your clients, your internal clients and your external clients are confused about what you actually make. 
And how do I know this? Because you tell me they are. <laughs> so for your external clients, we're going to ask, how is your product delivered? Is it cased? Is it pelleted? Is it rainbow pelleted? Describe all of this stuff here. Okay. And if you're casing things, you got to describe what's actually in that case because your customer needs to know what's coming in that bill of lading. All right. Mm. So next thing you're going to do is you're going to get your camera out and you're going to take pictures of your products, product labels, product packaging, because if you need to run a recall, the FDA and the USDA love you a heck of a lot more if this information is present. All right. Your clients are going to need this too. You're going to send this information to clients. This is one of the first things we send to clients when we run a recall. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is what you just learned, which is pretty amazing, right? Mm -hmm. So now you know what you make, guys. And I will, as a bonus in the Meat and Poultry Hassock class, send you the zip file after this class so that you can um, do that specification work and have the specification SOP, all right? So I want you to just stop thinking about it, about your specification and go get your customers, okay? And enroll your inter internal customers in, in what you guys actually do and be a solution to a problem, right? And you know this, right? Because you only buy stuff, all right? You only buy into a program at work when you think it's a solution to a problem. That's why you're here. You guys think that a meat and poultry hassle class is a solution to a problem. And I agree with you, by the way. <laughs> all right. And it's a different, but it's a different solution to different ones of you. When you write your specifications, you get to stop describing the features of your product and you get to describe the benefits. So, and that is a much better conversation. We start talking in our conversations with our employees, with our customers about the results we're creating out in the world. That's a much more exciting conversation, right? Because people don't buy your food. They buy a solution to a problem. People don't buy a meat and poultry hassock class. They buy a solution to a problem. So what problem are you solving for your target customer, whether it's an in internal customer or an external customer? Mm -hmm. And then you ask yourself, what are the benefits of getting that problem solved? And there are financial, emotional, and physical and spiritual benefits for that, okay? Imagine if you were having those conversations at work and not the conversations you're usually having. Doesn't that build the business you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. So what you do is you hand your customer your specification, you stop talking features, and you start talking benefits, all right? So what's stopping you from doing this is the time, commitment, the overwhelm, and the experience of doing it. So let's break those down because I want you to be uncomfortable and do it anyway. The first time you do this, it's gonna take you an hour and every subsequent one is gonna take like 30 minutes, all right? I promise if you schedule this in your calendar, you can do it, <laughs> all right? But do it chunks at a time, okay? Like I've been doing this stuff for a really long time. I can sit down and it doesn't take me an hour to write a specification, but I can do it all in one go. You may not be able to, that's totally fine. Just bake, break it into chunks. And I wanna promise you that the process of writing is rewriting, whether you're writing a specification, a HACCP plan, or the great American novel, my friends. Think, write, and then rewrite and be okay with it. It's totally fine because you can totally do this. All right. So for all of you who are freaking out right now, you are in exactly the right spot. I got your back. We're going to do this. All right. So you're going to build the business the universe is calling you to build by starting with specifications. All right. So next question is... USDA grant of inspection, is this right for me? So let's start clearing this stuff up. Um, you need a USDA grant of inspection if you are slaughtering what we call an amenable species. Note, not everything you can think of is an amenable species. Wholesale and value-added products almost always need a uh, USDA grant of inspection if they're going across state lines. And if you are doing more than 20,000 poultry per year, you need a poultry uh, inspection, which is where you see P next to the USDA bug instead of just M. All right. And if you see a V, that means voluntary. If you are doing processing of non-amenable species, okay, which are things like bison, um, quail, 
rabbits are not amenable, um, that sort of thing. You're doing that, you need a voluntary inspection. That costs money. All right, you're gonna need an EIN number. You're gonna need the home address of all stakeholders in your business that own over 10% of the business, okay? All of this information can be, is on a PDF from FSIS called a 5200-2. 5200-2. So if you Google FSIS 5200-2, you'll get this information. Okay, you also need a facility that actually works for meat production. And it has to have these four things, okay? I cannot get a facility passed to USDA if it doesn't have a bathroom. Because believe me, I've tried. <laughs> you have to have a bathroom that's within your control that you know who is coming in a, into and going out of, uh, and you know who's cleaning it, okay? You have to have an office for the USDA inspector. No, the USDA inspector doesn't need his own bathroom. You have to have a facility with cleanable floors and walls, and you have to have a pest control plan, okay? And you have to have a facility that meets pest control guidelines, okay? It's not okay to have a pest control plan that's not working, and your pest control plan is not working if you stand in front of your door into your production room and there's daylight around it, all right? That's not working, my friends. Mm. All right, you need to have a reasonably good map of your facility that separates out USDA functions from non-USDA functions, which means retail stuff for those of you who are retailing at your like physical USDA facility. Hmm. All right, you are going to need an epic amount of food safety documentation, which is why you're all here, right? Hmm. So let's get some uh, definitions out of the way. HACCP, which this whole course is about, stands for Hazard Analysis for Critical Control Points. No, it does not stand for have a cup of coffee and pray. SOP stands for Standard Operating Procedure. We're gonna be doing a lot of talking in these first couple of slide decks about that. And ASP is an Improved Supplier Program. Remember, what do you make, how do you make it, and where do you get your supplies from? All right, so the way we build HACCP plans around here is we build them on the backs of all of our programs. There are programs around people, product, and process. You do those correctly, and you create the conditions to create safe food. Um, so why do we do it this way? Because you conserve resources and you minimize waste, okay? I'm gonna get on my soapbox here, folks. Recalls are super expensive in terms of your time, the talent around your business, and they are wicked expensive, okay? I charge a lot of money to run a recall, folks. Uh, but you know who else it's really expensive for? It's expensive for the animal that died to make your food that is getting thrown in the dumpster, all right? When you do this stuff well, we honor the lives of the animals that we, that, that we work with, that most of us raise and we're pretty close to when we want them to have one bad day. We honor the lives of the workers who show up and do the work and we honor our customers, okay? So that's why we do it this way. Mm -hmm. So your HACCP plan actually rests on these programs, these prerequisite programs, and it rests on education and training. So you're here in education and training, and there are a lot of different parts of that, all right? And it exists in this milieu of a true management commitment around the whole process, a management commitment to continuous process improvement, and it rests on usable documentation, my friends. I have been in places where everything that ever happens to a steer from slaughter to grind exists on one piece of paper, and I promise that is not usable documentation, okay? Don't do that to yourself. Also, and we're going to talk about this a little later, but don't implement an electronic record keeping system until you have a paper system down perfectly, because then you're just going to end up automating a bad problem or like a, a bad system. And you're going to have two problems. You're going to have a systems problem and you're going to have an automation problem. All right. And then finally commit to auditing, internal auditing and external auditing. All right. And we're going to talk more about that at the very end, but Asking yourself, did I do what I said I was going to do is an integral part of your HACCP planning. Okay, so what do these prereq programs and their SOPs do? They create the foundation of your HACCP plan and make hazards not reasonably likely to occur. When hazards are not reasonably likely to occur, well, then we don't have to control them, all right? And so your prerequisite programs 
they are made up of the standard operating procedures and logs for whatever particular program you're talking about. So for specifications, you have a specifications SOP that I'm going to send you, okay? And then you have your spec log template, which is the... Um, which is the uh, uh, like the thing that I went through, which says, what do I actually make? Okay, you can also have a register. All of those three things roll up into the specifications program. It's not just the SOP. And that's true over almost every single S, uh, prerequisite program that I write. Mm -hmm. All right, so in order to get a USDA grant of inspection, you're gonna need SSOPs. This stands for Sanitation Standard Operating Procedures. And the USDA groups this as your pre-op sanitation procedures, your post-op sanitation procedures, op means your operations, because if you're running a grinder, you need to, um, if you're running a grinder, uh, you need to clean that up after four hours of use, so that would be operational sanitation. Personal hygiene means how your personnel are keeping people clean. And then sanitary dressing is how you are um, making sure that when you are doing slaughter and you're breaking, that you're taking the hide off and the head off and all that sort of stuff, that you are, um, uh, that you're not like splashing back or you're not getting ingesta um, in, the, in the product so that you're keeping the product clean. So that's sanitary, that's sanitary dressing. Okay, so um, you're gonna have people programs, all right? So your people programs are all of these different things, okay? And this is basically how you work with the people in your facility, all right? If you're in the power group, we have all of these programs for you. And I wanna point out workplace violence programs, all right? I write this for USDA because I have had USDA inspected facilities where the employees threaten the USDA inspector and then the USDA inspector locks the door, okay? So we write workplace violence programs so that employees understand that they may not, for love or money, get into it with the USDA inspector, okay? All right, you're gonna have products programs. So this is all the things that happen with your products. And I also wanna tell you, these are kind of like my, the way I do it. I have clients that get all these things and put them in their own buckets and that's totally fine. All right, so um, we have SOPs around all of your receiving and storage and refrigeration and stuff like that. Specifications, which defines your product, so that goes under product. Approved supplier programs are incredibly important. Um, and we're gonna be talking about supplier approval in, um, in, a little, uh, in a couple of slide decks. If you are importing things, okay, that are not meat, you have to understand whether or not you need to do foreign supplier verification. If you have questions about that, send your questions to training at dirogofoodsafety.com and we'll answer you about whether, you not, whether or not you need a foreign supplier verification program. For those of you who are making super fancy foods, all right, and doing things like taking imported cheese and putting it with charcuterie on a tray and serving it, that cheese, if it's imported, has to come in under some kind of foreign supplier verification program. If you are the consignee, one, you will know that. And so if that word is completely unfamiliar to you, then don't worry about it. Ugh. If you're the consignee, you have to know that that cheese comes in under a foreign supplier verification program, okay? Under the product program, we also have all of our operations instructions. So for those of you who are going uh, for SQF or BRC, you have to have instructions on how you make your food, okay? And your operations SOP lay out all the different things, and then your work instructions have all the different, like, turn this knob here and set this lever here. That's your work instructions. We also include recipes as a work instruction because those are um, controlled documents, or they should be. And um, they really tell you how you are operating your facility, okay? The rest are all processes. So you have processes. So you take processes, you apply it to meat, and you get, uh, and you get product. And um, in a USDA facility, you're going to have most of these. I highly recommend doing document control last. If you are doing SQF, you must have document control with USDA. Document control is um, 
uh, not mandatory at all. Uh, all right, humane handling planning, we are not covering, this is not a humane handling course, we're not covering humane handling for those of you who are doing slaughter. Uh, biosecurity is of epic importance. I just did a Facebook Live and I'm gonna post it on, um, on the Dirigo Food Safety Facebook page around African swine fever because everybody's very, very worried about that. So biosecurity is of utmost importance if you run a facility and have a farm, okay? So, and then pre-shipment review is mandatory under USDA and that's uh, USDA asking, did you meet all your critical control points, do all your sanitation and all the things that are required in order to meet um, the requirements to get that USDA book, okay? All right, so now let's talk about records because if you don't do records right, it doesn't matter what else you do, okay? Your records should be uniform, okay? If you work with me, you notice every single thing I give you looks alike, and that's for a reason. And I'm not gonna lie, it's a psychology reason. Because when you hand the USDA records and they all look different, it makes them look harder. And when you hand them something that looks all the same, it, um, they subconsciously think you've got your act together. And so that's, and, and plus you run a more efficient operation, all right? So that's kind of why we do it, all right? So every activity that has to do with a critical control point or shows up on your pre-shipment review must have a date and time and an initial, all right? It must be done at the time your records are observed and you have to use actual observations and values. So don't stand in front of me, all right, and tell me that your refrigerator is four degrees C and never go look at the thermometer. I tell you this because people have done this to me on more than one occasion. <laughs> don't do that, <laughs> all right? And then all your records should be reviewed and your reviewer only has to do a signature and a date of review, okay? You're going to have a whole lot of records. Invest in a good filing cabinet. My filing cabinet, and I don't run a USDA facility, was $700. And for that price, I think it should make the coffee, my friends. But so you're going to have a ton of records. And the documents that you start in this class are part of your records. And this is just another list of all of the records that you are going to have. All right, now, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you. This is being recorded, okay? And it's going to be, um, it is going to be uh, live on the, well, not live, but it's gonna be added to the membership site that you gotta log in for, okay? So you can come back and you can pause it on this screen and make sure you have all of these things, okay? Next thing you're gonna need is you're gonna need recall procedures, all right? If you don't have recall procedures, send us an email at, at uh, training at dirigofoodsafety.com and I will just send you a recall procedure. We give it out free because I don't want not having a recall to be what's standing, or not having recall procedures, what's standing between you and actually doing it. Okay, so final question. How do you make what you're making? Mm -hmm. All right, this is where HACCP planning comes in, okay? So we, um, we like to call HACCP the 12-step program here at Dirigo Food Safety, all right? Now, take a look at these steps, and you're going to notice that we've actually covered an awful lot of this, all right? And that's on purpose. We preload doing HACCP planning into the first six steps of HACCP planning, which takes us all the way through conduct a hazard analysis. If you do those six steps correctly, everything else is easy. Okay, so mm, fill out those four first four columns for every product, all right? And then you're going to figure out which HACCP plan it's going to fall into. Mm, all right, mm, so that is our first set. I'm going to go to our second set of, uh, um, our second set of slides, so bear with me here for a second while I, nope, there's the thank you. So that's our first set. Uh, do, do, do. All right, why is it not letting me out? Click to exit. All right, so let me uh, open up the next one and we are gonna go through background, all right? Mm. Do, 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 okay. There we go. Go back to slide share. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. 
I promise they don't teach this in vet school, my friends. All right, here we go, slide share. All right, so, all right, let's get some more background done. So here's what I need you to do. Your first homework is send us an email and introduce yourself, even if you think we know who you are, and that's supposed to be Dirigo Food Safety. I can't believe I made that mistake. So that's Dirigo, actually, I'm gonna fix that right now and so that you guys have the right one you think you do such a good job but that's dirigofoodsafety.com all right right there cut and we're back okay dirigofoodsafety.com training at dirigofoodsafety.com and tell me who you are <laughs> okay i love you all and i want to know who you are and what your goals and your dreams are so hasip is a systematic approach for identification, evaluation, and control of food safety hazards. If you haven't got that this is a system after that first presentation, let me tell you, this is a system. And the more familiar you are with systems thinking, the happier you are going to be running your USDA facility. Hmm. All right, so it's a management system that actually, frankly, empowers everyone if you're doing it correctly. Because we draw out and think and document what we do. All right, so because there are only four steps of how to run a business and this is how I run my business and this is how you should run yours. Decide what you're going to do, write down what you're going to do, do it, and then figure out how that's working. Those are the four steps for running a successful business. Those are also the four steps for running a successful HACCP plan, okay? So the HACCP system started when NASA was putting astronauts into space, okay, and we needed to send them safe food. It has evolved since then, okay, and um, it has been adopted in the United States as the way we do food safety. This is not how they do food safety in Europe. They do risk-based food safety. In 1985, the National Academy of Sciences, which is all the people with the PhDs, decided we were doing hazards-based food safety, and they adopted HACCP, and it has been rolling out in one form or another ever since then, okay? In 1996, the reason you guys are having this class is because it took 11 years from 85 to 96 and one massive recall and a couple of kids dying at Jack in the Box for the USDA to mandate HACCP in meat and poultry process. And we call this, the, they call it the pathogen re reduction rule, okay? We also call it the mega reg. Um, and the whole point is we identify hazards and control them. It is a planning system that we use in USDA in exempt food code production, okay? So if you are curing in your restaurant, you likely need a HACCP plan. If you are undergoing a third party audit under the Global Food Safety Initiative, you need a HACCP plan. But it isn't your whole food safety system, friends. Your programs are not your HACCP plan. They make hazards not reasonably likely to occur, so you don't have to control those hazards in your HACCP plan, okay? It's not an OSHA regulatory system, okay? It's not your operational SOPs, and it doesn't have anything to do with your state and local like fire regulations and things like that, okay? Your systems determine your results and how good your system is and how you think about your system will create your results, all right? And that's what we work on around here. We create cultures that create results. So, these are our 12 steps of HACCP, um, all right? We're gonna be coming back to this slide a lot because it's super important you know all of these. HACCP, again, rests on this education and training. And you'll notice I repeat myself because what most people try and do is they try and build their system from the top down and I'm trying to get you to think about it from the bottom up. Um, all right, and it starts at the cold chain, all right? And it really starts at the ranch. From the ranch, we go to slaughter, cut and wrap, value add, and into the distribution chain. Believe it or not, you can write HACCP plans the whole step of the way, all the way until we get to our consumer, okay? But then um, you've, gotta, you've gotta be able to understand food safety in every, in every step of the system and how you are affected by it, both in a raw product and a finished product way, all right? So for food safety and livestock, all right, this is actually where the, food, uh, the Federal Meat Inspection Act started, and this was in 1906, and for those of you who are accounting, this is actually before um, the, uh, the Jungle was published, <laughs> okay? Um, the Jungle getting published, like, really pushed this into the fore. 
All right, but this is where in slaughter, we got anti-mortem inspection, where a veterinarian would look at the animals and make sure they were okay to be slaughtered. And then would once they were slaughtered, they would look at them on the inside to make sure that they were, um, that they were acceptable for human use. And the, as somebody who's trained in how to, in how to do that, um, we have gotten to a point where um, this is, I don't wanna say this is all changed, but I can't tell by looking necessarily whether or not an animal is safe to eat, okay? And that comes into play with, um, uh, with downer cows and things like that, all right? So we have those conversations around humane handling. All right, but this is everything that um, the Federal Meat Inspection Act did, okay? And then in 1957, we got the Poultry Inspection Act and established these species as poultry. These are the only things you can slaughter under poultry. Notice pigeons, quail, not in here, okay? If you're doing that, that's voluntary inspection. There are 11 kinds of uh, USDA HACCP plants. All right, most of you are probably not doing irradiation. If you are doing thermally processed, commercially sterile food, you also fall under an FDA jurisdiction and you need a scheduled process for your product. Some of you make your bacon under secondary inhibitors. Um, so that's like adding salts and things like that. Heat treated shelf stable is things like beef jerky. Not heat treated shelf stable is all our charcuterie products. Fully cooked, not shelf stable are things like um, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, deli meats. Heat treated, not fully cooked is um, pork side meat or bacon. Raw, not ground is all our intact products. Raw ground is all our non-intact products. And then of course, red meat and poultry slaughter. Mm. You have to understand your products and processes. You know what the USDA expects of you. And if you are doing FDA stuff, you got to separate that stuff out. Okay. So remember this, Send it in to us, training at dirigofoodsafety.com. All right, grading versus inspection. Grading is not inspection. There are very few graders out there and we're not really training anymore, okay? Grading is voluntary much, and, and think of it the same way you think of your organic plan, okay? Grading is quality, organic is quality, all right? And not mandatory. Inspection is mandatory. And inspection, USDA inspection is all about food safety. Okay, so state versus federal inspection versus food code. There are now five states because Maine is one of them that have cooperative interstate shipments. That is very complicated. And if you have questions about your state, send us a question at training at Dirigo Food Safety because it's the, the way you do it in your state depends on which of those five states that you're in, okay? If you need a HACCP for your food code, know that when you're going in to write your HACCP because they're probably gonna tell you your critical control points. And this can be simultaneously easier and harder because they're gonna tell you how, how to do what you're doing versus doing it under USDA where we tell the USDA how we're doing it. Mm. All right, guys. So you have two pieces of homework. Send us your chart. All right, send us your introduction. You can do both of those at the same time. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we look forward to your homework and we will see you again, same bat time, same bat channel on Thursday. Thanks so much and have a great day.